This is Around the Farm, the podcast about all things ag. I'm your host, Clint Chaffer, and today we're going to be talking with Zach Hansen from the Climate Field View Science Weather Team about this year's planting forecast. Stay tuned. Zach, welcome to Around the Farm. Uh, thanks for joining us here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, how about uh, how about you tell our uh, our listeners out uh, here uh, where are you at, where are you where are you from, and and what do you do? Sure. Yep. So, name Zach Hansen. That's you. Got all probably guess. Um, I'm based out of the Seattle office for Climate LLC. Um, run the weather science team there. So basically, the, the group of meteorologists that help basically everybody within climate use weather effectively. Originally from Portland, so I've Pacific Northwest, born and raised. Always tried to stay back in that region. Um, did my undergrad and PhD both in meteorology at the University of Utah and the University of Wisconsin. Kind of taking a tour around the world, did a postdoc in China before sneaking back uh, to Climate Corp. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's like, you know, West Coast, Midwest, and then the Far East. Yeah, exactly. It was a, kind of a surprise. Like, I always didn't think I was going to want to travel that much. I'm kind of a homebody. Um, but once you get going a little bit, you realize it's pretty fun. Um, and I like new things, and it was, it was a pretty big opportunity. So here's a here's a, a fun com- or a fun question just to start out with here. You know, you talk about your worldly travels here. Does the overall meteorology aspect does does that change as you get into like different climates and different countries all over the world? Yeah, a- absolutely. Even within the United States, right? Like, um, I'm a thunderstorm guy. Like, I got into weather. I got caught in a thunderstorm when I was seven years old. I like lightning was striking ten or fifteen yards away from me. Absolutely terrifying. I thought I was gonna die. Afterwards, I thought that was amazing. Um, <laughs> and so like I, I got into it. But then I realized you don't get those very much in the Pacific Northwest. You'll get like one thunderstorm a year. You're not going to get striking lightning. But in the Midwest, you do get those. Um, and so, yeah, there was a, it was a pretty big drive for me to, to move to Wisconsin for a while to, to check out some the same in China. There's a quite a bit of thunderstorm activity in China as well. So. so, so I mean, with your love of lightning and thunderstorms, I mean, have you been a storm chaser at any point in time? I so I like to consider myself a storm waiter as opposed to a storm chaser. I, I like to know where the storm is going to be. That way, I can relax and wait for it to come to me as opposed to chasing it. I, I like to think I have a pretty good success rate at storm waiting. Uh, I've accidentally had tornadoes just kind of pass over me before. Um, yeah, maybe t- too successful. It's, Nowadays, with models and stuff, it's pretty easy to storm chase really, really well. Um, so yeah, kind of got lucky or unlucky, depending on how you define that. Wow, wow, yeah, I have uh, I have seen one tornado in my life. Uh, I watched it wipe out our uh, neighbor's house uh, from our deck, and oh, wow. uh, I uh, I never want to witness or experience that ever again. I unlike you, I was terrified. So. Yeah, it's like even for me when it's happening, I'm like, I need to get to safety now. Um, and I was lucky enough that it was like a F zero, like kind of a dinky tornado. Um, like the the funny story is that it brought a neighbor's trash can to my house and like lined it up with my other trash cans, like just like perfectly in line. Um, that was the only damage to my to my house it was just an extra trash can. My neighbor lost a trash can. Um, yeah, not too much, not too much bad things happened with that one, and I'm very lucky for that. Well, well. Speaking of crazy weather patterns, I know that uh, we have had back-to-back La Ninas. Are are we uh, are we going to expect a third one coming in here to uh, to the twenty three season? So, funnily, we have actually had back-to-back to back La Ninas already. Um, so, yeah, we're calling it the triple dip. That was this winter. Um, probably not. We just ended La Nina like a week ago. Interestingly enough, so we had La Nina brought cold and wet weather especially the west coast of the United States. It's been pretty cold here in the Pacific Northwest, especially um, the northern Midwest as well. It's been quite cold this winter. Um, that's probably going to end pretty quickly. I think the the sea surface temperature anomalies, which define El Nino and La Nina in the equatorial Pacific, have gotten to that warmer that warmer portion and La Nina is basically over. The, the weather might have some residual patterns um, over the next few weeks to months, but... Um, Looking like pretty confident, no La Nina next year. So, so walk me through again. So, if if La Nina is not here, uh, and uh, what kind of weather pattern then? It, what, what kind of weather pattern does La Nina typically bring? And then, right. what can we expect? I guess moving forward as we as we move into this next planting season. Right. So, I'll, I'll start with the overview of El Nino La Nina, kind of global impacts, and then 
bring it down to the U.S. and North America. Um, so La Nina is basically this cold temperature anomaly in the equatorial Pacific off the coast of South America. Basically means there's lots of cold water upwelling in the Pacific Ocean. Um, it, what, what it does is it basically drives the circulation in the Pacific called the Walker Circulation, which makes lots of thunderstorms over Indonesia. And it's weird to think that thunderstorms over Indonesia really impact the weather uh, in North America, but they do. Um, lots of what we call teleconnections between weather in some places and other places. Um, what this means for North America is it means there's going to be colder weather in the northern half of the United States in the La Nina event. Um, basically, the whole Pacific jet stream pulls down, polar air gets farther south than it normally would. It means a lot more rainfall events for the West Coast, um, typically the Pacific Northwest, but this year California has been impacted really heavily. Um, and the Pacific Northwest has been about average, but still quite a bit colder than average. Um, for the Midwest, it, as I said, means colder. I think the upper Midwest also means snowier. The lower, like the Southeast, is warmer and drier than usual in a, in a La Nina event. Um, yeah, but that's the main impacts for, for the Northeast. It's a little bit trickier because they're off the, on the Atlantic coast, and so the Atlantic Ocean plays a bigger role than the Pacific Ocean does. Makes sense. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a typical La Nina. So can I blame La Nina for, you know, the last few years, it seems like my house sitting here in Illinois, I continue to get hit by these uh, polar vortexes, right? They come down and just completely freeze me out for a, a week or so. I mean, is that is that because of La Nina? And can we expect like maybe less of that moving forward? It might be less. That, that might be a reasonable thing. Any individual polar vortex is pretty hard to attribute um, to La Nina just because the way the polar vortexes form is not Pacific driven. It's like this whole polar circulation thing that is its own sort of can of worms. I, I will say probably the actual number will be higher in a La Nina year than El Nino year. But like any one event, it's like, oh, that's not, that's the La Nina polar vortex. Not, not quite. Um, so Zach, the, the agreement is, is you're supposed to just guarantee me those are done. Like just a hundred percent. Not yeah. gonna happen. Get, get more money <laughs> under the table next time. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, so so looking forward into you know, I mean, we're we're on the cusp of of planting. Honestly, I mean, some folks uh, in the in the southern regions, of course, planters are already starting to run. In the Midwest, we're still probably you know roughly about a month away. Uh, what can farmers really start anticipating as they start thinking about, you know, is this going to be a cold, wet spring? Is this going to be a dry spring? What, what, what kind of things could maybe they largely expect? Right. Um, I would say for the southern half of the Midwest, it's looking like trending towards warm, warm dry spring. Um, not totally 100%. And then warm or dry doesn't mean totally warm or totally dry. There's still thunderstorms and stuff, of course, happening. I think Arkansas today, for example, is getting hit by some pretty, some pretty rough weather. Um, but I think the general trend is towards warmer and drier. For the upper Midwest, still a little unclear. Like the trend seems to be warmer and dry also, but the weather that's been happening and like will continue happening for the next few weeks to months uh is still on the cold side, I wanna say. Like things can change pretty quickly, but um in the short term, still probably pretty cold. In the long term, I do expect it to be to be pretty warm and dry this year, just given that the transition from La Nina to into neutral to maybe even an eventual El Nino um, is occurring. Now, it, would this have an impact? You know, like let's say if there's uh, you know farmers sitting in some of these regions, um, you know, I think across like you know Kansas and Nebraska, there's uh, some spots there that have uh, really been hit with some droughts. Does the change in this weather pattern maybe open up some some opportunity to to get some rainfall? Maybe where they haven't been getting rainfall over the past year. It's possible. Um, I. You can't necessarily pick out any one location, but the, the generally changing the pattern does do a good job of shaking things up. Like, I mean, we can think of comparing for California last year to this year. They had huge drought problems last year in California. Um, this time last year, Santa Barbara had no rainfall. Like it hadn't rained yet. This time this year, they've already hit their annual total for rain. Um, that sort of thing, yeah, kind of kind of crazy. That sort of thing can happen anywhere, um, and it, it does help that a pattern change is occurring. Can't necessarily say it's definitely going to rain. Um, but I would rather have the pattern change than not change if a drought's occurring. So that, that's, that's the answer I can give. Yeah. yeah well, I, I know you, you know, you mentioned, uh, California and I was seeing the other day, uh, you know, they were struggling with a lot of their lake reservoirs, you know, were at detrimental levels last right. year. Right. Uh, and I was seeing some pictures of, you know, one of them rising like 250 foot over the last like month and uh, really replenishing uh, a lot of that needed water. 
Yeah, they were on like a six-year drought, like just like six years in a row of below normal precipitation. And then this one year, I think they're sitting at like three times normal, just in general for the state of California snowpack, sure, like 300%. Um, this is like exactly what they needed. It's kind of sucks in the short term because there's like lots of flooding and damage and so on. Um, but for agriculture, the reservoirs filling up is, of course, a good thing. So, you know, as, as, as farmers start, you know, thinking about getting their planters ready and starting to, starting to get everything to roll, uh, what are some of those tools that, that you'd recommend a, a farmer to be utilizing? Maybe, maybe they're not using it today. I know a lot of folks have, you know, whether it's looking at, at field view on, uh, on the weather uh, forecast or whether they have their own local TV news station app. You know, I know a lot of those out there. What are some other tools that, that you'd recommend to a farmer to, to maybe start helping them determine, hey, what does the extended forecast, you know, really truly look like? Right. I mean, so personally, I, I do use field view just for my, my medium short-term weather forecast, like the next week if I want weather. I know that the forecast high quality is super high. Um, looking into the longer term and other, other tools that I care about, especially if you're planting in the Midwest, uh, NOAA's Storm Prediction Center has really, really good resources for like telling you if there's a risk of severe weather in your area. Um, and they have updated like charts for every like couple of days. So like you can see the next two days if it's going to be riskier the couple of days after that. Um, and they typically have like really well written information about what they think is going to be happening and why and like what could change to make something happen or not happen. Um, that's what I go to look at for like interesting weather. That's how I did my my storm waiting, for example, as I just read the SBC recommendations and like, okay, I'll just just do that one thing. Um, other things for longer term outlooks, the, there's something called the NOAA climatological outlook. And that's actually what I use to get my climatological outlooks. They're fairly skillful, especially in that one to three month forecast range. Um, nothing you're going to want to plan a wedding on, of course. Like the the weather predictions for three months out are not going to be like day to day accurate. Um, More but they will trend the, wise, exactly. Yeah, yeah. it's going to be giving you the trends. Say, oh, it's definitely going to be warmer than normal, or wetter than normal, or drier than normal, or colder than normal. Um, those things they definitely do have skill for that time period. It's just like a, a way of measuring it differently. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, that's that's always helpful to to understand. You know, I mean. Uh, that's always the struggle of, of forecast, right? Weather forecast. If you get too far out, uh, you look at it one day and two days later you look at it and it's completely different. Yeah, right? exactly. So, that absolutely can happen, especially if you're carrying out like the day-to-day changes in weather. Like the prediction for rain at the end of the week could shift two days by the time you look at it like a day later. Um, that thing, that can absolutely happen pretty much any time. For these trends, it's a little bit less shaky just because of the way they combine the weather together. So those will stay a little more consistent. That makes sense. Well, uh, Zach, I know you're the, the the lead of the weather team at Climate. Uh, ha- could you give us like a, a, a rundown? What what does that mean? Like, what are you all doing? You know, as far as for what what's that? Some of that exciting work that you're putting into the into the Field View app or putting into into Climate's website. Yeah, I wish I could say we were like go out going storm chasing, seeing like what hail was happening on farms. Um, the reality is that we're, we're mostly sitting inside working on computers, basically kind of munging data together, um, building models to predict things like weather impacts on, on crops. So a lot of my team works on basically predicting disease and yield in crops um, using weather data. So you can actually do a pretty good job of predicting weather or disease in your crop, say like northern leaf blight for um, corn or white mold for soybeans is going to occur basically just based on the weather. Um, so getting that incorporated into a model and then getting that out as a, as a feature is the main thing that we're focusing on right now. And that's a big part of what our team does. That is fascinating. Because I've heard, you know, like you talk about, uh, I, I didn't realize, you know, that some of these uh, spores, right, can go into the air, into the jet stream, and your weather pattern kind of determines on where they land. I mean, is it, yeah, is it some the, of that looking at as well? So for southern rust, that's another corn disease that does, is something we actually take into consideration. Um, for white mold and for northern leaf light and a lot of the other ones, they are spore-based, but they're actually based on rainfall splashes, funnily enough. So if you have like heavy rainfall, you're more likely to get uh, disease occurrence than if it's just light rainfall or just kind of wet but not heavy raining conditions. Um, yeah, some surprising features like or surprising weather conditions that go into determining whether the disease is going to occur. Like, doesn't necessarily matter how warm or cold or wet or dry it was. It's like, did it rain really hard? Um, or has it been humid for five days in a row? That surprisingly matters a lot too. Um, yeah, it's kind of fun to fun to do. It's not like the flashy weather job that you see in Twister or something, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty satisfying work at least. 
Well, again, for a guy that may not like thunderstorms <laughs> that much, uh, I would much rather be inside punching on a computer than being out in that fun Twister-like movie, you know? So yeah. I just wish you could combine the two. Yeah. <laughs> gotta, gotta, gotta get the project about t- tornado impacts on crops or something. Gotta, gotta talk to the higher-ups about that one. There we go. There we go. Well, you know, you talk about like just some of the, uh, you know, working through a computer, I would assume there's a lot of algorithms and things of that nature that uh, that you're working on. As you start seeing, you know, across the industry, there's a lot of talk around artificial intelligence. I know there's, a, you know, several things have been released over the last few months that have really got just the general public, you know, kind of more, I guess, involved in, in, uh, in, in uh, artificial intelligence. Is that going to come into play into the into the weather space? Do you believe? Uh, absolutely. I mean, even the models that we're building now rely on machine learning to make those predictions. Like, there are physical relationships between these weather occurrences and the diseases, and that drives how we put weather information into these models. Um, but there's so much randomness in the weather that we can't like necessarily mathematically produce all of that ourselves. And so it makes sense that we rely on machine learning um, to get extra skill basically out of these models. So so now I just got to dive into this here. I'm going to ask you a, a uh, for for Zach to look out into the future, okay? So if we it, you know all these cool things are happening within weather forecasting today, uh, if you look out 10 15 years, how do you see, you know, a lot of this technology changing our our weather forecasting? Do you see it being just incredibly more accurate? Uh, or or what are what are some of those things that you'll end up seeing some of them impact there? Yeah, I, I don't think it's going to be like world changing in terms of accuracy. I'll say we're actually pretty accurate like five days out still. Um, not not amazing. It's only five days um, for for some things like ten days for temperature or something. Um, but rainfall around five days. I would expect the time range at which we are accurate to extend quite a bit, um, and that's pretty exciting. Um, not super flashy, but like from a meteorologist perspective, like if you could add four days to your rainfall forecast, that's a lot of money you're saving for a huge number of industries, logistics, agriculture, basically just anything. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, pretty excited about that. Um, yeah, let's say I, I'm, I'm, I always think about, you know, just all these different technology advancements, you know, from artificial intelligence, especially their impact on agriculture, right? They're, right. Uh, whether it's artificial intelligence, automation, uh, drone applications, all these different things that are that are happening, it's just that we're entering into this incredibly exciting space, uh, and uh, and I think it's just going to have like you know just really cool impacts across the board. You know, as, as we're sitting here talking talking about weather. Yeah, the other thing I think will, will probably happen that maybe even more exciting is the increase in spatial resolution of these models, like. A model that serves the weather like on your TV weather forecast or on a field view or basically anywhere has a grid. Basically, you can think there's a point every four or five or 10 kilometers over the entire planet. Those grids will get finer and finer as time goes on, just due to computational improvements, due to like advances in technology, like artificial intelligence. I could imagine in 15 years, the grid being like twice as fine as it is now or maybe even finer. So you can imagine if you have a four kilometer grid now, you're getting to the field level pretty soon um, wow. in the future, which is super exciting. That is that that is exciting. I mean, as you start thinking about, you know, trying to prepare for a fungicide application or, uh, you know, going out and putting your herbicide down, like th- things of those things of being able to get more and more accurate uh, from a, uh, or better resolution, I think that would just be uh, incredibly exciting. For sure, yeah. What are uh, what are some of the tools uh, you use personally, Zach, from a, from a weather perspective? Oh, I'm I'm the worst one. I I just use my phone. <laughs> like I would love to say, I, actually today I did look at the models. I, I was giving a weather discussion for our internal team uh, meeting. We give one every other week uh, for the Seattle area. Just that's where most of the team is located. Um, so I was looking at the University of Utah's what we call the weather wall. If you, it's like weather.utah.edu, you can look at all the model output. Um, but mostly I just like, use Apple Weather or use Field View Weather. Um, they're pretty good. I think that's that's the funny thing. Like. Meteorologists are useful because they fine tune those outputs. Um, but if I'm not predicting for somebody's wedding, hell, pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> it says it's going to be 63 tomorrow. It'll probably be something around 63 tomorrow. It says it's going to rain the rest of the week. It's probably going to rain the rest of the week. Yeah. It's, that's what I go for. Yeah. No, <laughs> absolutely. Hey, you know, you, you talk about, you know, forecasting for somebody's wedding. How 
many phone calls or text messages do you take on like a weekly basis from friends asking you, hey, Zach, what's the weather going to do? It, so it used to be a lot more. Like when I was in grad school and in my postdoc, it was like, I would say weekly, and I have forecasted for a number of weddings in the past. Um, ever since I started talking about the work that I do, people got less interested. <laughs> <laughs> like if, if, I, if I pinned the spiel about like what my work is, they suddenly stopped calling more. So I just figured that was a, a good way to get to get out of the the forecast the forecast realm. It's kind of like a, a software engineer having to like fix their parents' computer. <laughs> my parents asked me for a weather forecast, and I just talked about like how diseases are going to be occurring in the next week or something. <laughs> so, suddenly, those calls get less and less. There, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and all oh, that's for me. hilarious. Well, I, I, another couple questions I'd end up asking, and this is actually taking us out of the U.S. and uh, and looking at our friends up north uh, in Canada. Uh, you know, as we think about the the three different areas within Canada, the prairies, eastern Canada, and the uh, and the Maritimes, uh, what can they expect for for weather uh, going into this year? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, the Maritimes and eastern Canada, especially, are less related to the rest of the U.S. style weather um, than you might expect. The prairies, of course, kind of an extension of the upper Midwest, the United States, in terms of weather. Um, just Rockies to the west and a, a pretty flat plain region to the east. Um, also impacted by La Nina in a similar way to the upper Midwest. The Maritimes in eastern Canada are less impacted by ENSO, just kind of like the east coast of the United States isn't as impacted, kind of close to the Atlantic Ocean. Looking out into the future for the next six months or so, it looks like it's going to be a little warmer on average than in the prairies than um, would be normal. The rainfall signal is not so clear. I think it's a pretty similar signal to the upper Midwest and even the southern U.S., um, Maybe looking a little bit dry, but nothing like really crazy. For the Maritimes and Eastern Canada, I was looking at the output from like Environment Canada for their long-term models. It looks like a coin flip. Like it looks like it could be just as easily wet, dry, warm, cold. I mean, given that they're pretty confident the prairies are gonna be warm, I would lean warm also for Eastern Canada, just kind of that's how the jet stream would track. Um, but in terms of the rainfall, it's not a clear signal right now. And I think this is something that will clear up a bit more as we get through May. That's typically when you get a better predictability for the rest of the year. Um, but until then, can bet on warm. I'd still pack a rain jacket if you're planning on doing, like going on travel or something. Well, that sounds great. Well, no, I, uh, I appreciate the, uh, the insight to, uh, to, to Canada there. So For sure, yeah. Well, now we're going to jump in. I got to pull out my my sheet here because I have a, uh, a a little quick firing thing. So you just got to you got to choose one here. We're going to do a little game called this or that. Oh no! Yeah, so we're going to start out with the most important one that we ask all of our guests: auger wagon or green cart. Okay, that's, that's of course the auger wagon. I don't think there's <laughs> any other option really. Woo! All right, all right. How about uh, mountain or beach? That's a very hard one. Mountain? Mountain. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All I like right. to ski. How about rain or snow? Rain. And like I'm a I'm a rain person. I born in the rain, live the rain. That's my thing. How about tea or coffee? Coffee. Also, yeah, Pacific Northwest. If you don't like coffee, you're not allowed to live here. That's how it, <laughs> that's how the rules work. <laughs> All you tea drinkers, sorry, you gotta yep. find somewhere yeah, else. <laughs> go move to England or something. You know, not allowed. <laughs> how about Apple or Android? I use a Google Pixel, so I am an Android person. Man, you're you're the friend that, that pops up green bubbles, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I've ruined everyone's time. Actually, a lot of my friends use Android as well. I kind of wonder if it's a, a thing that like all my iPhone friends just left us and all the Android people are together. But yeah, all right, all right, fair enough, fair enough. How about La Nina or El Nino? Uh, La Nina for sure. Got to got to get the snowy weather for Pacific Northwest. If you want a good ski year, need a La Nina. El Nino is. Usually a bad ski year, so I'm going to stick yeah. with you. Oh, I'm going to throw a curveball here. It's not on my list, but I'm going to ask you anyway. How about snowboarding or snow skiing? Skiing, of course. Yeah, skiing, skiing. Okay. Is, is the way to go. I've learned when I was like three years old and skiing ever since. Can't, wow. Can't choose anything else. And how about from a movie perspective, Day After Tomorrow or Twister? You know, these are like my top two movies of all time. Um, so you're making it really hard on me. Twister's like a class. So, Day After Tomorrow is so bad, it's good. Twister is just like actually good. Um, so I've got to go with Twister. You know, I think I would have to, uh, I, I'm going to have to agree with you on that one. Like Twister was just like, 
That was one. Of, what was that? Probably ninety five, maybe. Yeah, ninety five, ninety six. Yeah, yeah, and and like just the 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 special effects and everything else. I mean, I just remember yeah. watching that and just being absolutely amazed at like just you know the cow comes passing around, you know, and and yeah. just it still holds I up. I watched it a couple years ago. Did pretty good. Yeah, I didn't yeah. appreciate how many ridiculous things happened in the movie, like the cow <laughs> thing, like the whole surviving that five by tying themselves outside adjacent <laughs> to a farm with a huge amount of farming equipment. Um, <laughs> but yeah. It's still a fun movie. No, like I said, I totally agree. And I do like Day After Tomorrow, though. It is fun to yeah. think of, like, the whole flash freeze aspect and, like, how that, yeah. you know, changes, yeah. changes totally things, Totally scientific. Right? Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A, bit of a, a bit of a funny one. You guys, I am missing out that you didn't put Sharknado on the <laughs> on the question list. Which, which one? One, two, three, four? <laughs> like, which one are you going with All here? of them are classics. They're all, like, required watching for anybody interested in weather. There's also a hurricane category six with invisible hurricanes. Um, that's mm. another really good one. Yeah, well, you know, also great I, weather I'm movies. actually ashamed, Zach. I, you know, I, I I consider myself somewhat of a of a movie expert, and Sharknado I have never watched. So I've, I've only seen Sharknado one. I okay. will say that. Like that was that was enough Shark and NATO for my Sharknado. <laughs> 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 All right. Yeah. Not now. At this point, you're just waiting, storm waiting for your Sharknado to happen. Exactly. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I just, I'm on the coast now. Just gotta get the tornado happening. Gotta have the sharks out there. I'll bait the water before the tornado comes in. Possibilities, man. The possibilities. Yeah. Well, Zach, I know you're an incredibly bu- busy individual here, and uh, I, I don't want to take up any more of your time, man. But I greatly appreciate you coming on the show, having this conversation with us, and really getting us thinking about. You know, the weather patterns ahead as we start moving into probably one of the busiest times of the year for uh, for agriculture. Uh, so thank you for all your insights. For sure. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Hey, a big thanks to Zach for joining us here today. That was a wonderful conversation. And thanks to you, the listener, for joining. If you like this podcast, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe, and maybe share it with a friend or two uh, as well. And also, Around the Farm is brought to you by Climate Field View. And you can listen to us wherever you listen to podcasts at. And until next time, we'll see you around the farm.